Okay, so welcome to Managing Stress Through Change. It was interesting at the beginning of the day to hear John Digby uh, talking about mental health and the stresses <laughs> in the American industry. And uh, when COVID locked uh, New Zealand down, um, the exec realised that there was very uncertain times and many of our members were going to be uh, struggling either financially, uh, mentally, emotionally, um, over the stresses caused by the, the, the shutdown. And so we decided that it would be good to provide our members with some sort of counselling service. And so we established a link with EPA services. Um, and we've got Charlotte here, uh, who's going to explain uh, what they can offer for us. So over to you, Charlotte. Tana koutou, tana koutou, tana koutou kato. Ko Charlotte toku ingawa. Greetings, everyone. My name is Charlotte Allen. I'm the new business manager at Workplace Support, your EAP provider. Today, I'm going to tell you a bit about what we do um, and who we are and how we can help you. But first, um, we're going to cover the topic that Richard just mentioned. So um, managing stress through change. It's super relevant to all of us right now. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Just bear with me while I just share my screen so you can see the presentation for today. Hopefully you can all see that. <laughs> so managing stress through change. Why is it so relevant right now? Well, we just had a brief insight into that, but we're in this period of huge amounts of change, personal change, global change, and then for professional change due to that global change. So it's an, a really a level of intense change that we've been dealing with this year is unprecedented. And it's that constant flow of change that doesn't look like it's going to slow down anytime soon, but it's really the crunch point of it. So as a well-being organisation, we're seeing all of our clients coming in, dealing with this change, and it's really starting to take a toll on people. So before, it was good to be aware of this change and this stress, but now it's essential that we are aware and proactively taking steps to support ourselves. So over the course of the next half an hour or so, we're going to be doing a little bit of understanding about what stress is and the understanding of our own stress response and triggers to stress such as change and then what we can proactively do to support ourselves through it. Okay, so let's break this down a little more. <laughs> My trusty friend, saber-toothed tiger on the screen. Um, I think the thing with stress is that it, when we, even if we say the word it, stress, it kind of gets our blood pumping. And it's because we're used to associating stress with negative feelings, overwhelm, discomfort, you know. Um, and we know that stress triggers a biological set of responses. And this can include um, stress hormones in your system, like adrenaline or cortisol, an increase in blood sugar, uh, rapid heart rate rising blood pressure, all of these things, which is why it brings on this panic, you know. But as a biological function, our body thinks it's actually helpful by creating those symptoms because it's keeping us safe. So when our stress hormones are flying around our body, it's in response to stimulus that our body thinks is dangerous to us. So it thinks it's doing a good thing by bringing all these things on. And in the old days, this stress response enabled us to run away and escape from the saber toothed tiger. So it really kicked in, kicks in our flight or fight response, enables us to seek safety when we're threatened. So from a biological perspective, stress can actually be a good thing. <laughs> so as we can see on the slide, there was a man called Hans Selye. A uh, scientist who realised that there was there could be two forms of stress, so use stress and distress. So use stress was the good type form of stress, you know, motivating us into action, helping us to run away from that tiger, or getting us into gear and learning those lines. You know, whatever it is, it's that thing that motivates us and gets our energy going and gets us up and ready. But oftentimes we are on the opposite side of stress and we find ourselves in that distress mode. So this is when the stress response is it comes up as too much or disproportionate perhaps to what's actually happening. So we aren't being chased by the tiger anymore, but we still have those same level of stress hormones pumping around our system, encouraging us to take flight. Um, and this can lead to a whole host of symptoms. So that could be 
fatigue, anxiety, frustration, sleeplessness, all of these things that don't actually help us lead healthy lives. So perhaps it's not about the stress itself, but more about our response to the stress and how that stress can stop us responding appropriately or healthily to the situation. So the other thing to note about stress is that there are compounding factors to stress. We could name a list of 100 right now. We haven't got time for that, but we'll, lay, we'll name it three. And it's just to kind of give context that stress is a multifaceted thing. So first, environment, media, change. So our environment can have a huge effect on our responses change. So what happens if we are in a, um, a stressful home environment where someone is blaring music all night and we don't get any sleep and we're tired and wired? We go into work or rehearsals the next day and someone gives us feedback. Ooh, but actually just in that moment, because we've had such a terrible night's sleep, we totally bite their heads off. In this case, was the environment supportive of us giving a calm stress response? No. And the thing is, our brains were designed a really long time ago, so they actually aren't designed to be able to go at this pace of change. You know, we're handling environmental stresses coming at us left, right and centre. And actually some of these things, so for example, noise, pollution, crowds, even the blue light from our mobile, it's all change that our brains are now having to deal with and it impacts our ability to respond at a healthy level. Media. Um, so if we were in real life, I would ask for a show of hands right now. So we're just going to have to do a pretend show of hands. <laughs> but how many people here have found social media stressful in their lifetimes? I, for one, definitely have. And this is as a compounding factor of stress. It's because perhaps it's the public forum of it. There's a chance of public humiliation, constant comparison, but also because of the sheer speed that the change is happening that we're supposed to keep up with. It can be too much, too soon, too constantly, you know. But one of the biggest triggers for stress that we see with our clients nowadays is change. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm sure that when he painted this painting, he didn't think I was going to be using it in this presentation to illustrate change and stress. But for lots of people, me included, stress can give this sort of response. <laughs> change can give this sort of response. It's a stressful response. And the thoughts whirling around your mind at that moment, you know, will I cope with this change of circumstance? Will I cope? I've only just got hang a hold of and a hang of the last situation and now the next one is happening again. Well, I have to adapt and I have to start again and I have to change my behaviour. Will I be able to keep up? I don't know if I can. Will it work out this time? You know, the thing is that change is really actually the only constant we have in life. So it's tricky, isn't it? Because if change is the biggest trigger for a stress response and yet it's the only constant, it's continuous, does that, where will that leave us? Does it mean we're gonna be doomed to living in a life of stress forever? Hopefully not. Because just like our um, stress ratings before, does all change have to be bad? Perhaps not. Change is actually neither inherently bad nor good. What determines the outcome, just like stress before, is our response to it and our perceived ability to cope with it. So on one side where we had eustress, we've got joy and de-stress, we've got that stress. So for example, some changes can be filled with joy. Birth of a baby, a new job offer, winter to summer. <laughs> These changes can be great. And we embrace them because we think, ah, it'll be all right. I've got the tools to manage this. I know I can cope. I can embrace this change. But there are some changes that sit on the bottom of this scale and they aren't so easy, easy for us to respond joyfully about. So some of those changes create a bigger stress response in us. For example, change in finances, change in relationship, change in aging, restructure at work, a new boss, managing your life and family through a global lockdown, you know, and that is stressful. So the bigger picture of that is that we have micro changes happening to us every day in our lives. You know, oh, we don't have any coffee today, so it's got to be tea. Okay, we can cope with that. 
we have bigger life challenges that come our way and throw us out of kilter, like we just talked about. But we're also dealing, as Richard mentioned before, with a bigger, serious global change that's having a real time effect on us, namely COVID. So we're balancing all of this change all the time and trying to maintain equilibrium at the same time. So we used to be able to get away with it and say, oh, you know, I've heard of the concept of managing stress. It's going to be fine. I can cope probably, but not putting too much thought into it. But actually, we're living in a world now where the frequency, intensity, severity of that stress is just completely different. It's off the scale. And it's all centering on that unknown type of stress. So as we've never been a peri- through a period like this before, we've never had to deal with something like a global pandemic in our lifetimes. We're unsure of whether we can cope with it. And that's totally understandable. So it's totally understandable that it could be creating a stress response in us at some level. So we have to acknowledge this, be more conscious of it, but actually proactively support ourselves to to do something to move through it. Now, there are many reasons why we can choose to ignore the signs, ignore that, sweep it under the carpet or avoid the change that's happening. But if we do, we're going to be blown off course trying to hang on, you know, like a ship in the storm. What anchors us to the dock, like the ship in this picture, is the understanding that we can't control if change occurs, but we can control our response to it. We can learn to deal with it in a different and a non-stressful way. If we don't, we can we will become off the stress scale stressed, flailing around in the storm. That's a really difficult state to function in on an ongoing basis. So we like to use lots of tools in our practice. And one of the tools that we use is our stress escalator. And it can help with actually visualizing our current situation. So taking it out of the emotional realm and putting it into a rational place for us to be able to understand. So the stress escalator or is this tool here and it was de- developed by a doctor called Blair Sterling. And it's a model of understanding and then being able to cope with stress. So it helps you to track where your stress response is at any given moment. It's very simple. So at the bottom, we've got zero. Zero is no stress. Woohoo! It's great. Great news. But actually, that's so laid back that you're actually probably dead at that point. So it's maybe not that great news. Uh, One to three, we've got you stress. So what we talked about before. So that's that energy point, a bit of motivation to deal with those positive stresses and get us up in the morning. A bit like the alarm clock ringing. You know, that's stressful, but it gets us going. That four to seven, we've got that room to respond, but we're reaching our top end of our capacity level. So we can go up, but we have got room to go down as well. And that's that maybe a bit crabby, cynical, really maybe starting that stress is starting to take a toll, perhaps a bit anxious. Our stress response is heightening. And then at 10, we've got that critical 10 stress response point. This is sometimes called burnout, panic, anxiety, breakdown, we know the terms, right? When we're talking about this stress escalator, we want to start understanding that it's an escalator that functions up or down. It's not static. It's not, it's meant to be movable. Hence the guy moving, or girl moving up or down the stress escalator. So if we're at one to three, in that one to three use stress point, we have heaps of whole options available to us. We have loads of steps up the uh, escalator available for us to utilize if we need to. And it means that we can increase our ability to respond to the stress. So we have flexibility, we have room, and we've got movement to get away from the tiger if we need to. If we're at four to seven, we are on that fine line, we're heading towards that 10 point. We can still go up or down, but we're pushing it a little bit. But if we're at 10, we have no flexibility, no more steps to help us deal with the stress in a calmer way. It's too much. We're overwhelmed at that point and our system can't cope. And so this is a critical point where actually our responses are coming out as high stress and it actually starts becoming dangerous for our health. So we need to be able to sit on that middle of that scale and have that upward range of stress response available to us so that we can exercise control and choice over our response to the stress so that we're not making choices out of this panic or distress mode you know and I think that it's it's not realistic that we're going to be at zero stress all the time 
Um, it, we're aiming for that one to three, that use stress point. Um, two years ago, in that one to three zone, that may it be easy for us to achieve on a regular basis, um, or at least work our way back to easily. But we're, we're seeing, a, we're in a different um, world at the moment, where we're seeing a lot more of our clients coming through to us with that resting baseline being about four to seven mark, much higher on the scale. And this means that when that change comes in, um, and that next wave of change comes in, they recalibrate back to the place they were before. So that four to seven mark again, because they never quite shifted down before. So we're seeing people further up the steps more quickly, more often and for longer. So just for a moment, um, just have a thought to yourselves about where you think you are on the stress escalator right this second. I think it's a really important tool for us all to be checking in on this regularly. Something that we just, when we're in, in a stress mode, we just boom, boom, boom onto the next thing, quick, 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 trying to keep up. But actually we don't often take a moment to sit with ourselves and say, oh, well, actually I'm feeling a little bit stressed right now. A tool like this can really help us in the moment, in these moments, actually just take a little breath and a little moment to see where we are. Once we see where we are, we can then do something about it. It's also important to know where we are in the in a wider context. So, for example, our global context. So where is society right now sitting on this stress escalator scale? I would hazard a guess at that 10 mark or four to seven to 10, you know, close to the top end of that scale. So we know that we're in a critical end with mental health. Uh, um, issues at the moment. So in New Zealand, we know the latest stats coming out is that 80% of us are feeling mental distress or know someone in mental distress currently. Um, stress is up 23% in the last two years in the workplace and suicide levels are at their highest in New Zealand. So all of this, it's not just coincidence, it's a bigger demonstration of where we're all at individually and it really does have an effect on us and something that we need to be paying attention to. So what happens if we keep ourselves on the wrong end of that stress scale for too long? That 10 mark is that we have a burnout. So if we were a car, we wouldn't be going at red. We wouldn't be going at full rev 24 seven. If we did, our engine would break. We're just, we're not designed to do that. You know, it's there for an option to get us out of danger if we need to. But simply put, if we, we would actually break or have really bad road rage, but we would break if we were in that high stress situation for too long. I'm relating this to our brains. So what's happening on the bottom end of that stress scale, so like zero or that one to three point, is that our frontal cortex, that rational, logical, reasoning part of our brain is at the front. That helps us make sensible, level-headed decisions. So if we can sit in that part of the stress scale, then that's the part of our brain that's actually making the decision. So we're much more likely to produce a calm and stress response. But when we're at 10, the top end of that scale and that critical point, that's when we're operating from our limbic system. So our frontal cortex is shut off and our limbic system comes into play and that's running the show, our limbic brain. Now, this is the primitive part of our brain that controls our flight or fight response. As you can see there, so survival, flight or flight. And it's that survival mode that kicks in, that get, getting away from that tiger. It's great in the old days if we had to get away from that tiger, but when we're faced with an average workday challenge or uh, with colleagues, that isn't actually that appropriate, you know? So the whole point is about de-escalating ourselves. It's okay to be in flight or flight or survival mode at some points, you know, it's there to help us survive after all. And actually, if you're surviving through this time of intense challenge, then that is great. But what we want to always be doing is recognizing moments that we can move to more comfortable places or places that we can be in comfort or thriving. So as we, as with escalators, they come up, they, but they also come down and we want to make sure that we can control that movement with as much grace as possible so that we're not just crashing down with a massive bump. You know, you are in control of your escalator your stress response so we can't live in town all the time that's just too much for us it's too much going on it's too much coming at us but we need to be aware of where we are on the scale so that we can proactively notice that and choose to st step ourselves down it's massive strength in doing this and reaching out and this is where resilience comes in so 
Resilience is the ability to de-escalate ourselves. So it's the ability to continue normal functioning under stress or pressure or come back to that point of healthy functioning as quickly as possible. So that's that one to three range. So it's either to sit, stay sat in that range and respond healthily and in a calm way from that place or come back to that one to three zone as quickly as possible. So if you're someone who's experiencing lower levels of resilience right now, then it'll be harder to de-escalate de yourselves as quickly as possible. So building up a resilience in these times is something that's really important because it helps us get down that escalator. So resilience isn't necessarily innate. It's not a skill that we're born with. It's something that can be learned and practiced over time. And sometimes it is that continual practice of these things and just reminding ourselves of the basic things that we can do. And the thing is, there are, there are many things that we can do actually to keep ourselves um, moving down the escalator scale. Lots of them will be per personal to you and something that you need to check in with yourself. You know, what makes you feel good? What makes you feel calm? what helps you to bring down your stress response. But the most important thing is to give yourself a solid basis to do this from. Now, you're gonna look at the next few things and say, this is really basic, we already know this, but actually, this is the thing that gets chucked out of the window first, when quickly, the quickest when we're having a stress response. And all of the things that we're gonna talk about in, the mo in a moment are actually things that help us balance our body chemistry and reduce the amount of stress hormones flying around our systems. If we can stabilize this on a chemical level, it, it means that our brain's less likely to reach into that limbic point and encourage that stress response, that flight or flight. So it's about keeping our blood chemistry as balanced as possible to help us keep in that one to three point of calm stress responding. So, Good sleep. I know I said it before, it's gonna be the easy ones, but these are so crucial. Good sleep, exercise, nutrition, fun, and talking. So good sleep, you know, seven to nine hours. And before that midnight point is super important. We know what it's like when we, when we don't get that amount of sleep and and life is ticking along like normal, let alone if we're in that period of massive change. So it's just a really important to help us, our, our functioning, getting that sleep. Exercise, we've got to do it. I mean, how many of us know we've got to do it and we, we aren't? But it really does get that endorphins flooding around our body. Just 20 minutes a day, it's something that we really must start penciling in. Like I said before, these endorphins are helping balance and neutralize the cortisol, the adrenaline pumping around our bodies. Likewise with nutrition, you know, if we're eating things that are good for us and actually positively contributing to a healthy gut balance, that our guts are, there's, our guts are direct uh, linked to our brain chemistry these days, uh, not these days, but we're only just realizing the, the vast links now. But it's so important that we're fueling ourselves with the right fuel and food. Having fun, this sounds like such a cringy one, doesn't it? But actually, there's a chemical reason to it. Having fun, so laughing, joking, that serotonin that's produced in that time actually, again, is replacing that adrenaline, is replacing that cortisol, bringing that level down, enabling us to come from that balanced eustress one to three period. And finally, talking to someone. So we all know of the old wives saying, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. But it's so true. It's imperative that we actually take note of some of these things. And they said it before it was because it was true. You know, removing that burden from us and giving ourselves time to breathe and share our problems. It's imperative that you take these proactive steps in these moments of change. Um, and if we can get the basics right, it creates the foundation for this strong, resilient patterns, a stable platform for us to be able then to take a moment, have a breath and have more personal choice around our response. From here, then we can function from that frontal cortex with less stress, you know, and move ourselves up and down that stress escalator with more ease, which is the aim of the game. So in summary, for the first part is change is constant, sadly, but it's not the change, but it's our response that matters. And we can manage our response to that change. 
by doing the basics, but also reaching out. And I think that's where we come in today. So, you know, our partnership, uh, Workplace Support and ETNZ, we've been, we're partnering, the partnership's been created so that you can all take care of your emotional needs right now and reach out during this massive time of stress, help build strong, resilient foundations and get support proactively before that crunch point, before you get to that 10 out of 10 on the scale, you know? We want people to be reaching out in that one to three point that you stress or that four to seven, you know, not waiting till it's 10 out of 10 critical. So who are we as workplace support, your EAP employee assistance providers? So it's our mission to champion and support workplace well-being. We've been doing it for over 50 years. So we're actually one of the longest EAP providers in New Zealand, which is pretty cool. Um, but we've been working in partnership with organizations um, for all of that time to give support to anybody that needs whatever they're going through, whatever the reason. So it's about helping people deal with everyday issues, but also those bigger ones, those bigger blocks of change that come out of nowhere. So that could be dealing with the finances, as we mentioned before, managing a restructure at work or actually going through these, this huge period of change that we're all seeing. It's about getting everyone feeling empowered, supported, getting those strategies to move us down that escalation scale. So this is what everyone has the opportunity to access and reach out proactively for now. Probably the number at the bottom of that screen, that 0800 443 445, that's super important and one that I would recommend everyone take a note of. And it's the first port of call and it's available to you 24 seven. So from here, we can assist and book you into any of the services you may require, depending on your needs. So um, the one that most people come to us for at them is counseling. So this, um, I'm sure you all know what counseling is, but just in case you don't, it can be really helpful to have a safe space where you can break down the issue in detail, work or personal, and it's in a safe environment that you can put strategies in place to deal with it. Sometimes it's actually really helpful not to be talking to your family necessarily or your colleagues or your boss. It's sometimes really help, helpful and healthy to have a fresh perspective, you know, with that independent person to support you. Financial guidance and planning, as we mentioned before, you know, COVID has brought a lot of stress to many industries, including yours, and actually a worry about, OK, when's that next paycheck coming in? Well, when will the industry be getting back on its feet, etc.? And actually, one of the things that we can one of the things that we as humans tend to do in these times is bury our heads, perhaps with financial things that prop up. We're all human. We all do it. But our financial guidance and planning service is there to support anyone who is worried about their finances. So, again, it's that safe, confidential space to put all of your money worries and concerns out and questions out on the table and get some practical guidance and put a plan in place. You know, sometimes that can be really um uncomfortable doing it by ourselves or actually something that we just bury under the carpet and they are oh, we can come back to it another time but actually it's really good to be proactive about these things and sometimes just having that plan in place takes a huge weight off finally uh career direction so specific career direction so this can be about having a deep dive look at your career what are the goals you want to achieve what are the steps that you need to get there? What are the obstacles to your success? So having a really focused session around that can be helpful sometimes. You're all entitled to three sessions and all you have to do is call us up and we can book you in. You don't need to tell anyone that you're doing it. You just call in and have that conversation and we can work out what the most suitable session for you is. Barriers to support. So we touched on it before, that resistance, you know. And I'm here today today, I'm here today today, I'm here today to also tell you that sometimes people feel daunted, scared or overwhelmed about taking the first step and reaching out for support. So you might feel that your problem's too overwhelming, but lots of times it's the opposite. People might feel that their problem isn't big enough or they don't want to bother anyone with it. But actually, this is all totally normal. But I'm here to just encourage everybody that um, it's not just a service to support people in dire need. It's about supporting anyone wherever they are on that stress escalator scale. You know, we want to really encourage people to come sooner rather than later to look at ongoing strategies for your general well-being. So it's not just a crunch point. Um, here to reassure also there's a confidential service and we're used to dealing with that all manner of concerns. So we can support you. That's what we're trained to do. And we're ready on the end of that 0800 number to pick up your query. 
Now, if you're on the call as a manager, um, there's a different set of um, things that services that you can um, access as well. <laughs> so there's the top three workplace wellbeing challenges was actually pretty interesting for everybody. But the in the 2002, there was a workplace diversity service conducted and actually the top three biggest factors in mental health for employees were um, 74 percent mental health of employees, 71 percent was the work life balance, 69 percent was stress. So if you're someone that's uh, managing a team or looking after other colleagues, it's really important that you're aware of that. Um, if we break down that top one in a little bit more detail so that mental health of employees, that came out as pressure, workload, and not feeling supported enough in the role. So it's actually um, about recognizing that poor well-being amongst your staff members or colleagues or company crew has a real it has a real effect on actually not only the feeling of the whole organization or group or team, but actually, you know, it's not going to help you and your bottom line. Supporting your employees in the best way possible, encouraging them to connect with a service like this and take make use of it, being mindful of these common triggers like work-life balance, stress, encouraging everyone to be conscious of them is really how you can best remedy this issue. And so I'll just run this through this briefly. Again, if you're a manager, you can access this service from us. And I would highly encourage you to make use of it. So for example, training, we've got a whole heap of training you can access. So it's such as having mental health conversations at work and how you can better have those. Uh, professional supervision, if you need a little bit of um, fresh eyes on whatever project you're working at. Critical incident response, so if something critical happens on site, and actually your team need a debrief or de-escalation, then we can come in with trained responders. If any accidents happen or things like that, then actually we can support with that. And then the other three at the bottom, briefly, alcohol and drug intervention. So that's there to support your company's ongoing practices. If someone needs specific support, we can support with that. Wellbeing consultancy. So actually, if you need support around your wellbeing plans for your organization. And psychological services, that's if somebody needs a bit of extra support with a diagnosis. Again, that's the same number to call, so that 0800 number, 0800 443 445, and we can talk you through the process. So we are here to help. That's the whole point of us as an EAP service, a well-being provider for you. Um, yes, so thank you very much for your time. My name was Charlotte, and just for a quick reminder, back on our topic that stress was that constant. It's not about the stress, but how we're dealing with it. And we can manage our response by reaching out and asking for support. And that's where we come in. But I'm just going to ping back momentarily to our questions slide and over back to Richard to see if we had any questions that I may or may not be able to answer today. Well, thank you, Charlotte. I hope I'm live. No, I don't see myself going live. Um, yeah, thank you, Charlotte. I, I don't see any questions in the um, question and answer box at the moment, so we'll just give a second or two to see if anything uh, comes through. Um, I would recommend actually uh, using an, um, an EAP service. I've used it myself through the education uh, provider uh, that's linked with uh, Burnside High, and uh, the three counselling sessions were were really worthwhile actually and you can actually get them extended for a bit longer if, if something is really brewing and you need more time uh, and you could work that through with the people at the time. Um, Absolutely that's a really good point actually so you get those three services but actually if you need more then you can just get that extension. And lots more it's all free and as you saw popping up uh, br briefly and I saw it coming up as a comment just before it came up um, someone had said it was the best thing that ETNZ has, has organised is arranging that uh, we can give this uh, counselling service for free. So thank you for explaining what you have done, Charlotte. And uh, if there's no more queer or no questions, um, I think we've just about covered everything for us. Great. So, uh, so, uh, thank you so much for having me. So I really thank appreciate you your time. Take care and have a great rest of conference. Thank you.